Uh, thank you, Bernadette, for that, that very generous introduction. Uh, amongst the various academic things there, it was only in her mentioning that I stopped being a Plunketeer that you might get a hint that I was a Plunketeer for some several years. And, and the Plunket Centre has always been a great help to me with its, its people, uh, the resources, especially of its library, uh, and the advice that it has given over the years, not just to practitioners here at the St Vincent's Complex and many others around the country, but also to the bishops uh, and the clergy, who often uh, are asked by people what to think about this or that. And the easiest answer, if it's anything to do with bioethics, is to send them to the Plunkett Centre or ask the Plunkett Centre to tell us what to advise people. They are a, a wonderful resource uh, for the church in Australia and Bernadette's given them tremendous leadership these many years. Uh, Robert, thank you also for the welcome here to the hospitals. Uh, they've been such a help to me in recent times but to so many in our nation for so long. And uh, to Professor Greg Craven, the Vice-Chancellor of the Australian Catholic University, thank you for uh, your part in the Plunkett Centre happening and for uh, the invitation to lecture tonight. Now let's see if I can, oh, we're already on that one. Good, that one will do. Parrot Man, the Opera. Over the last few years, Ted Richards, or Parrot Man, as he is now known legally, has undergone a number of procedures in order to resemble more and more closely a parrot. These have included numerous tattoos, injecting coloured dye into his eyeballs, surgically splitting his tongue and removing his ears, and the introduction of bone horns into his skull. The process on which this rather operatic ex-shoe factory worker spends most of his pension is not yet complete as he plans to have his nose surgically modified to look like a beak and his eyes moved more to the sides of his head like his aviary friends. Mark Pacifico, representing the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, says he's absolutely horrified by this case. He thinks any self-respecting doctor should regard such requests as indicating an unhealthy mental state and refuse to cooperate. While healthcare is a service, it is not simply a matter of providing whatever the consumer demands. There are medical ethical judgments to be made. But what if Ted insisted that he was a bird trapped inside a human body? Shouldn't he be free to exercise such choice over his own body? What if a psychiatrist insists there is nothing wrong with him or that being made more parrot-like would be good for him? What if Ted said he would be suicidal if denied such treatment? As Dr Pacifico himself admits, in today's climate, whatever it is that you want, there's probably a doctor out there who'll do it for you. Parrot Man the Opera reflects a growing trend to drive through medicine in which the body, agents, relationships, institutions and practices are conceived of as objects subject to the logic of supply and demand, transaction and consumption. A common shorthand for this is to speak of healthcare as commodity as something with no intrinsic end or ethic, but rather something which individuals and communities invest with their own meaning and is provided on demand to those who can pay. We could give many more examples of the commodification of medicine. The healing arts are now regularly used not to heal, but to harm, to kill unwanted children, remove unwanted organs, sterilise unwanted fertility, 
short and unwanted living and dying, search for and destroy those with the wrong genes, and dispose of the sick and elderly. Surgery or drugs may be used to hide ethnicity or biological sex, or to enhance appearance, athleticism or sexual performance. Some seek to extend the human lifespan and capacities indefinitely, perhaps with organs or stem cells from dubious sources. Others propose a more comprehensive transhumanist project. And while every sort of medicine is available on demand to those who can pay, those who most need genuine therapy often lack access. In this lecture tonight, I'll identify some of the ideas that underpin this phenomenon of drive-through healthcare. Consider some of its attractions and shortcomings, and then propose some more satisfactory melodies for healthcare going forward. Act one, the idea of drive-through healthcare. The drive-through conception of medicine is underpinned by three important ideas, which have more than a bit of truth in them and are especially powerful in modernity. The first is the idea of the patient as an autonomous agent who chooses the health care that suits him or her. Agency, the self-governing, self-making and self-telling aspects of free choice, is rightly emphasised today in many areas of life and especially in medical decision making. Too often in the past we are told physicians assumed a paternalistic command and control approach and patients became passive recipients of whatever the doctor thought best. But only the, the patient themselves can fully appreciate their own wants and needs, experience and endurance, and so pursue the goods of life and health in reasonable ways within the context of their other pursuits and whole of life goals. And only the individual in the family can do the most mundane but crucial kinds of care in the areas of hygiene, diet, rest, exercise, substance use, simple self-nursing and self-medication for themselves and their family members. Only when we are unsure what to do or unable to do it for ourselves, do we turn to health professionals. And even then, it's for advice and assistance in preventing health problems or responding well to them, rather than to ask professionals to assume control over our lives. The emphasis on personal autonomy and responsibility in contemporary healthcare and bioethics also serves to highlight the importance of listening to and informing patients well, seeking their genuine consent, eschewing medical assault and paternalism, ensuring the observance of a range of patient rights, and avoiding intrusion by government, insurers, healthcare managers, health professionals, even family members, where they should not. In an era of greater knowledge about patients and their health care options, among patients of their health care options, and greater affluence than in the past, it's not entirely unreasonable for people to expect to receive what they ask for. If people want to look like parrots or otherwise use medical care for their own purposes, then as long as they can pay and are not hurting others, they should be as free to do as other people who do other socially unusual things. Scene two, the doctor as supplier of a service for a fee. <coughs> Related to the idea of the patient as an autonomous agent who chooses the health care that suits them, is the conception of the doctor as the supplier of a service 
and thus of the doctor-patient relationship as a service contract. On this account, healthcare is rather like school enrolment or legal service, negotiated on particular terms between a service provider and service consumer. This view of the healthcare relationship plays out powerfully in lists of patient rights and professional responsibilities, making explicit the implicit deal by which doctors promise to inform their patients truthfully about their condition and prognosis, options and risks, to respect their choices as well as their privacy and confidentiality, and so on. It highlights the importance of respectful dealings with patients, good communication and negotiation in decision making. Proponents of such a contractual view point out that much of contemporary reality has been medicalised including matters previously dealt with by family, church and others. That much that has been medicalised has also been commercialised and that in these changed circumstances old conceptions of fiduciary relationships, covenants or vocations must give way to the negotiated preferences of producer and consumer. Physicians can no longer be presumed to be especially altruistic. Witness their aggressive marketing, the kickbacks many receive from third parties, the unwillingness to assist even at emergencies if this exposes them to legal or insurance risk, the closed shop to newcomers from overseas, the chronic undersupply in poorer or remote areas, and the opposition of the profession to proposals to ensure or reform universal access to health care often meet. Instead of romanticising the motives of physicians and the basis of their decisions, those who argue this way suggest, we should face up to reality and ensure that they are at least faithful to their contractual obligations to their customers. Scene three, healthcare as an industry in a free market. If patients are viewed as autonomous agents who choose the healthcare that suits them, doctors as providers of a service for a fee, and the healthcare relationship therefore as one of supply and demand, then healthcare will be seen as an industry in a free market. Such a marketplace of multiple providers and consumers determines through competition and free exchange who gets what and how and when. It rewards long years of medical study, long hours of medical practice, research and development, and long investment in medical entrepreneurship and manufacture. Whatever of healthcare in more innocent times, today many would say it has become a commodity, in the sense that it has a market price or relative exchange value can be transferred on that basis and consumed. What's more, in modernity, medicine is often a high-tech activity, delivered by teams of specialist providers of tests and treatments, often within highly complex institutions like this one. The practitioners require professional education use patented drugs and processes produced by multinational corporations and are paid by consumers, insurers and others. All aspects of an industry. Entrepreneurship and competition are said to favour effective and efficient health care, advances in medical technology and delivery, the capitalisation of health care infrastructure and research and cost containment in an area inclined to overutilisation and exploding costs. Defenders of a free market approach point out that while healthcare, like food or housing, may be a basic need, even a human right, no one suggests that food and housing should be free or normally provided by the state. Governments, churches and other voluntary organisations and extended families 
may provide safety nets to assist those who cannot otherwise obtain health care. But this does not warrant abandoning the free market as its ordinary context. People should be free individually or in groups to choose the what, when and how of health insurance and care without being pressured to conform to somebody else's grand plan or interests. Nor should it be presumed that free markets are arbitrary markets. They are in fact constrained by the cultural, ethical and legal assumptions of the participants. Free market concepts, however partial, do assist us in understanding how healthcare works today. And we should not overstate supposed contrasts between medicine and commerce. Well that at least is the beginnings of a case for and a bit of analysis of the idea of drive-through healthcare. An intermezzo. At Christmas 2015, something provoked my immune system to attack my, attack my peripheral nerves. In less than 24 hours, I went from being more or less normal to being almost totally paralysed. I had contracted acute motor axonal neuropathy, a very rare variant of the already rare Guillain-Barre syndrome. Thankfully, I had the best of medical, nursing and physiotherapy here at St Vincent's. And I'm very pleased that my neurologist is here with us tonight. And then I went for rehabilitation at Mount Wilga and the general physician from there is also with us, as is my GP. I spent the following five months in hospital, gradually repairing those nerves and rebuilding the wasted muscles, learning again to walk, climb stairs, use cutlery, write, hold the chalice. The purgatory of paralysis and neuropathic pain was compounded by the humiliations of total dependence. Blessed with the gift of faith and many years reflection on life and death, sickness and health, I was probably better equipped than many to approach this unnerving condition. But this didn't take the suffering or the mystery away. I've long been persuaded by writers such as Alistair McIntyre and Stanley Hauerwas that we should think of the human person not as the self-sufficient, powerful agent of contemporary liberalism, but rather as always vulnerable, mostly needing help from others, and sometimes very dependent indeed. But for the first time since infancy, I experienced that firsthand and intensively. When asked what sense I made of it all, I groped for answers as anyone would and fell into silences as everyone should. But my reaction was significantly shaped by the example and wisdom of the family, friends, faith and traditions that had long surrounded me. For five months, I was embedded with people with Parkinson's or motor neurone disease, quadriplegia or strokes. And I puzzled with them through the experience of my body ignoring my directions. My spirit dissociating itself from this uncooperative body. Patients and carers taught me powerful things about the human spirit, perseverance in suffering, and transcending limitations. I had the comfort of knowing I would most likely very largely recover. Many of my comrades knew that they would only get worse. So I cannot pretend to know all that they were facing. But that experience and my continuing recuperation add bite to my reflections on the human person, travail and care on the allocation of resources to the disabled, 
elderly and dying, and so on. I hope that having been such a fellow traveller, I will have gained in compassion for the weak and gotten a little wisdom along the way. Which leads me to Act 2, my doubts about drive-through healthcare. Reflecting on that experience, I have new reasons both to appreciate and to question the commodification of medicine and the associated constructions of patients as consumers, doctors as retailers, healthcare as a contract for a service, and health institutions as an industry in a free market. Let me explain some of my misgivings. When I arrived at hospital, my body was packing up. In a few short hours, I'd gone from feeling a tingling in my right arm to complete paralysis from the neck down. Next, my lungs began to fail. Rather than worrying about dying, I was afraid of losing my ability to communicate, which probably tells you a lot about me. Alongside the pain and paralysis, there was the disorientation and powerlessness typical of many patients and the willingness to hand over in trust to my physicians. To compare me with a shopper at a supermarket, as some of the healthcare as commodity enthusiasts do, would be to misunderstand my experience of healthcare altogether. Much of the rhetoric of patient autonomy was intended to strengthen respect for the dignity of patients and empower them in various ways. Yet many patients today feel more disempowered than ever, or that their dignity is less well reverenced. The change in language and thinking from the patient as passive sufferer of disease and recipient of treatment to client or consumer of chosen services was supposed to promote greater responsibility for self-care and decision-making and greater respect for this amongst professionals. But where words like patient were essentially moral words, redolent of certain attitudes to suffering, endurance, trust and receptivity, words like consumer only indicate a kind of financial power. Seeing the sick as powerful contracting agents rather than vulnerable others due special protection and care may reduce not only overweening paternalism but also proper protectiveness. It may help us get what we want but not what we most need. While healthcare consumers may expect their contractual rights to be honoured, what the suffering most need is compassion in action. Those wedded to liberal bioethics tend to valorise personal autonomy and patient preferences so highly that despite talk of competing principles, rights or responsibilities, patient demands always or almost always trump all other moral concerns. But as long explored in Catholic moral tradition and some others, freedom is not only freedom from, but also and principally freedom for. Even very free, informed and competent agents must choose well rather than arbitrarily, which drive through healthcare does not encourage. What's more, Few sick people fit the bill of the idealised agent, making choices and contracts in full competence, knowledge and freedom. Many patients are only relatively competent, their ability to choose in their own best interests being compromised to some degree. No matter how excellent the information exchange between doctor and patient, and it's often far from excellent, 
patients have only a limited ability to receive and digest information about their condition and prognosis, treatment options and risks. They might think they know what they need on the basis of past experience, what they've heard from friends or what they've seen on TV or the internet. But as one commentator put it, most people have no idea if they need an X-ray. Buying healthcare is not a matter of reading online reviews and trying out it out to see if you like it. For most patients, it's sure, whatever you say, doc. Patients are also under all sorts of external pressures from friends, family, finances, culture and health professionals and internal constraints due to illness, pain, time, debility, confusion, alienation, fear and so on. When you're having a heart attack, you can't shop around for services. It's unreal to compare many patients with shoppers. Furthermore, only the relatively wealthy have the financial power to get whatever they want in healthcare. For most people, healthcare needs are highly unpredictable but potentially very expensive. Private insurance is an effective device for risk sharing amongst those who can afford the premiums and are admitted to the scheme. But there are many who would struggle to make the payments or have pre-existing conditions that exclude them. Without government assistance such as Medicare and charitable assistance such as church hospitals still provide, some people will fail to get timely testing or treatment and so end up being a greater burden to self, family and the system than they need have been. Even those who take a rather sanguine view of patient autonomy recognise that there are situations in which carers, family or guardians can exercise a good paternalism. Emergencies or compromised competence call for judgments by others as to what is in the patient's best interests. I remember in a vague fog being asked, had I ever had a tube down my throat? And then hearing people whispering behind me the word tracheotomy. I knew I didn't like the sound of that word, but I also knew I just had to trust them to know when I needed it and if I needed it and to do it if I needed it. Even in less fraught circumstances, the healing relationship must be one of trust and indeed patients often want their health professionals significantly to guide the decision making. The notion of shared decision making is gaining currency amongst some theorists in place of the more absolute view of patient autonomy previously esteemed. And in my experience, whatever the legal or ethical theory of informed consent, what actually happens on the ground is at best shared information, dialogue and decisions, and the exercise of more than a bit of delegated or assumed authority by carers. Scene two, doubts about doctors as suppliers. As contractual commercial conceptions of relationships have colonised the most private areas of life in modernity, it's unsurprising that the types of motivation, decision making and organisational structures characteristic of large scale <laughs> commercial enterprises tend to mark contemporary healthcare also. Doctors are often expected to respond like hired guns to the demands of their customers or those who are paying and some seem quite comfortable with this arrangement. Nonetheless, as Dan Brock and Alan Buchanan have argued, the traditional patient-centred ethic is not yet mere sham and rhetoric. Ironically, the high salaries, self-interested organised professional behaviour and institutional structure of medicine may have helped protect the possibility of altruistic behaviour 
on the part of the physician when guiding treatment of his individual patients. Many health professionals clearly care about more than just their hip pockets and the preferences of those who pay. Put baldly, they're in it to do good, therapeutic good. Some cultural factors, inherited codes of practice, medical education, professional associations, and I would add institutions such as the St Vincent's Hospitals, the Plunkett Centre, the Australian Catholic University, still militate against doctors becoming mere salesmen. The risk with McDonald's medicine, however, is that it shifts the balance between self-interested and altruistic motivations on the part of physicians. Brock and Buchanan point out it's especially important to the success of their partnership that the patient believe that the physician will be guided in his recommendations solely by the patient's best interests. Patients want to be able to rely on the truthfulness of their doctors and trust their recommendations. And that is harder in a situation of increasingly commodified healthcare. Scene three of Act Two, doubts about healthcare as a market commodity. Most people are uncomfortable with commodifying the body as if it were purely an object upon which various mechanical and chemical processes can be performed, or merely a collection of useful parts to be mined for use by others, used for research, or even patented by corporations. They prefer that blood and organ transfers be genuine donations rather than sales or confiscations and that human persons, including their bodies, be treated with greater respect than ordinary commodities. Likewise, few are happy with the reduction of health care to just another industry. Leaving medicine to the market means leaving it to the happenstance of the health, wealth, preferences and natural endowments of the participants. It means that many will lack access to a decent minimum level of health care, however grave their need. Others will obtain care, but only at the cost of their home, relying upon the charity of others or bankruptcy, as happens all too often in the United States. Markets give insurers and providers strong incentives to cherry pick the healthiest and wealthiest patients, or those easiest and cheapest to treat, leaving behind the poor, remote, indigenous and chronic cases. Thus almost all Western countries have a mix of for-profit and non-profit healthcare, funded and provided by a mix of individuals and their families, governments, private insurers, churches and charities. Many healthcare providers and commentators observe that left to the market, healthcare will be significantly overutilised in some cases and underutilised in others. And there will be little emphasis on health promotion and early intervention. This will have both therapeutic and equity implications. And there will be blowouts of costs, poor planning and shortages of services as well. It's often observed, for instance, that the relatively free market for healthcare in the United States has seen an escalation in health spending such that Americans spend far more per person on healthcare than anyone else, yet fail to get value for money in terms of population coverage or health results. The common good of the conditions for the flourishing of all the members of a community will only be served if there are effective mechanisms alongside the free market to ensure the provision of this social good to those who cannot easily afford it. Australians, Brits and Canadians, amongst others, with their universal coverage, get better value for money and better coverage than Americans in many respects. But they do face many parallel challenges. 
Which brings me to Act Three, the last act, you'll be pleased, of this opera. In this last part of my paper, I want to suggest three aspects of our medical moral tradition that might help healthcare recover a healthier sense of its identity and mission. The parable of the Good Samaritan has been the text most influential in shaping Christian understandings of healthcare. It presents one person's suffering and another's response. It tells of our common humanity, of the social glues of empathy and mercy, of virtuous character and of the principle of caring for neighbours in need. It's a very practical story. The bashed and forsaken Jew receives essential nursing assistance from the rescuing Samaritan. There is referral to an innkeeper and a third party payment. But this does not reduce the relationship and behaviour to a commodity transaction valued only for its medical efficiency or economic worth. Rather, we witness a story of intervention for the sake of the one rescued. Damaged and desperate humanity is saved by God. The suffering body or soul healed by Christ the physician. The sick ever since cared for by Christians responding to Christ's command to go and do likewise. As awareness of needs and ability to assist increases, so do the opportunities for neighbourliness. As the Second Vatican Council suggested, today there is an inescapable duty to make ourselves the neighbour of every person, no matter who they are, and if we meet them, to come to their aid in a positive way. Healing the sick and suffering was a major focus of Christ's ministry and served alongside his preaching to proclaiming the coming of God's kingdom. The blind, deaf, mute, hemorrhaging, paralyzed, leprous, even deceased received his healing touch. The beloved physician, Luke, recorded that from the beginning, Jesus saw his mission as bringing good news to the poor and sight to the blind. And that he later compared himself to a physician and a nurse. At his invitation, Christians see in every suffering person a brother or sister in need, indeed Christ himself in need, and serve him in them. In faithful imitation and continuation of that ministry, Christians have served the sick, suffering and dying throughout history through monastic pharmacies, hospitals and hospices. Orders of hospital and knights caring for sick pilgrims, nuns, nursing mothers and others, or religious brothers caring for the mentally ill. Medical and nurse training schools lay faithful dedicated to health care as their vocation sacramental and other pastoral care for the sick, systematic reflection on health care ethics. In other words, all the things the people in this very room do every day. On this view of health care as an expression of neighbourliness towards the needy, there is surely more we could do for parrot man than cut off his ears. Healthcare is about people who care for health. Contemporary Western societies entrust to professionals much of the task of healthcare on the understanding that theirs is a practice with particular internal goals and ethics, inherited knowledge and skills. Without these things in the background, the authority we invest in physicians would be unintelligible. But what does it mean to be a profession is this just a name for a posh job with a closed shop, worldly respect and a high salary? No, as commentators such as Leon Cass and Alistair McIntyre have explained, profession is an ethical notion entailing, 
entailing that whole long list of things. And I won't read them all to you, but it's about how you get to be a professional, how you conceive of yourself once you are one, how your fellow professionals bump up alongside you and continue to form and inform your practice, and how the general public then in turn regard and credential you. Sad to say the profession has not always guarded these ethical dimensions of medicine. Sometimes professional associations behave more like monopolists seeking to protect the income and privileges of existing members. Nonetheless, a conception of health practitioners as professionals helps underline that they are not merely hired guns, doing the bidding of customers, government, funders, insurers, managers or the market, but must make their own independent and principled judgments about what is good for the health of their patient and accords with the mission and ethic of their profession. For Christian carers, even talk of being professionals limps somewhat. They reach for a word like vocation to describe their sense of a transcendent mission to save, heal and care. They've heard Jesus call to the Good Samaritan to go and do likewise. Sorry, in the story of the Good Samaritan, to go and do likewise. Only the consciousness of such a divine mission can motivate and sustain the most disinterested, available and faithful commitment of health professionals. And it is this that gives their work a salvific, even priestly, value. This model of physicians and nurses as responders to a divine calling to rescue and care stands in stark contrast to, to drive-through medicine in many respects. So inspired, Healthcare can be a powerful demonstration of values such as spontaneous generosity, respect for the dignity and equality of persons, the sanctity of human life and health, special concern for the vulnerable and powerless, solidarity with and compassion for those who suffer. A commodity conception of healthcare will tell a different story. That said, we observe that the Good Samaritan pays his bills to the innkeeper and is not the only model offered us by Christ. The wise steward, for instance, is also praised. Christian health professionals, institutions and systems might be said to combine the merciful healer and the wily steward. In A Balm for Gilead, Daniel Sulmazy draws on our spiritual tradition to illuminate how the healing art is integrally tied to our sense of interconnectedness with others and with the divine. Reflecting upon sickness and suffering, sinfulness and spirituality, he argues that health professionals cannot persevere healthfully in their practice without a solid spirituality. When I was gravely sick, a year ago, it was my instinct to ask people to pray that I be given courage, patience and hope through my sickness and recuperation. Meanwhile, I prayed a parallel prayer for my health professionals. One eight-year-old boy wrote to me to say, Dear Archbishop Anthony, I hear that you are sick. I'm here to make you better. I'm going to pray for you. But in the meantime, you should take lots of Nurofen. <laughs> Scene three, healthcare is about a community that cares. Some economists have argued that certain goods should be regarded as public or social goods, such as air, water, national defence, policing, firefighting, environmental protection, public health measures, and perhaps health care more generally, including medical education, research and delivery. So essential are these goods to all the members of any community, they should not be treated as mere commodities subject to the whims of the market and those with market power. 
various secular philosophies have sought to make the case for health care as a universal human right and therefore a communal responsibility and to articulate the limits and scope of that right, who owes what to whom and so on. Health care has likewise been viewed in the Christian tradition as an entitlement in justice. The Second Vatican Council, St John the Twenty-Third, Blessed Paul VI and St John Paul II asserted that there is a universal right to health care. Benedict XVI likewise taught health is a precious good for the person and the community to be promoted, preserved and protected, dedicating the necessary means so more people may benefit from it. Still today, many of the world's populations have no access to the resources they need to satisfy their basic needs, particularly with regard to health care. It's necessary to work with greater commitment, he said, at all levels that the right to health care is rendered effective and furthering access to basic health care. In our day, on the other hand, we are witnessing an attention to health that borders on pharmacological, medical and surgical consumerism, almost a cult of the body, and on the other, the difficulty of millions of people in achieving a basic standard. Healthcare mustn't disregard the moral rules that govern and inspire it. Praising the work of doctors serving in the African missions, Pope Francis recently remarked, I thank you for what you are doing to promote the fundamental human right to health for all. Health indeed is not a consumer good, but a universal right, which means that access to healthcare services cannot be a privilege. Healthcare, even basic treatment, is in fact denied, denied in various parts of the world and in many regions of Africa, especially. It's not regarded as a universal right, but rather still as a privilege for the few who can afford it. Accessibility to healthcare services, to treatment and medicine, is still a mirage in those places. The poorest are unable to pay and are excluded from hospital services, even from the most essential and basic. This shows how important your generous work is in support of an extensive network of services. The sources of this communal responsibility for health care are several. Reverence for the goods of life and health in every person, an acknowledgement of the human need for health care if we are to flourish, our nature as interdependent and our supernature as graced for service, the obligation to express care and respect in concrete acts, and the need for large scale community contribution if health care is to be delivered at a decent minimum, minimum level. The natural expectation or right of members of a community to such assistance as necessary for their participation and flourishing. The particular concern, preferential option of Christians for the most disadvantaged as God's little ones, including the sick and poor. Of course, the ethical claim people have on their community in general and health professionals in particular has its limits. We have no right to expect that everyone else go without so we can have the best of everything ourselves. Were there time, I might say some more about the economics proposed by Pope Francis and its implications for healthcare, but you might read that when, when no doubt this is published in the Plunkett Centre uh, newsletter. Rag. That was Bernadette's description. <coughs> in arguing that health care should be regarded as a public good rather than being privatised as a commodity for exchange and consumption, Bruce Jennings and Mark Hansen contrast children fighting over cookies with communicants receiving the Blessed Sacrament. To conceive of this sacramental experience as one of production, valuation, exchange and consumption would be to radically misunderstand the sacred liturgy, they argue. So too, they suggest, some secular public works 
establish relationships amongst individuals that are not transactional or consumptive, but involve a cooperative and participatory effort to produce something of common value. This value is not appropriated exclusively by one of the parties to its creation. No one is simply a provider or a consumer, and the value is realised by communities as much as by individuals. Conceiving of healthcare as a vocation and profession, as a social good and responsibility, and even as a kind of communion, <laughs> challenges that pharmacological, medical and surgical consumerism that the popes since John the 23rd have critiqued. To conclude then, no margin, no mission has been a catch cry of recent years, suggesting that unless we, have, we are practical about realities of healthcare delivery today, we will not have the fat to devote to our lords the sick and poor. But if no margin, no mission is true, no mission, no mission is even truer. We need to know what healthcare is before we can do it well, let alone profitably. In this lecture, I've examined three underlying assumptions in, drive, in the drive-through conception of healthcare. That patients are autonomous agents who choose the healthcare that suits them. That doctors are merely contracted providers of that service for a fee. And that healthcare is therefore just a free market industry like any other. There are many reasons for thinking these claims are right. On the other hand, my own experience and philosophical reflection suggests that patients are not much like ordinary consumers or doctors and nurses like ordinary producers. That the practice of healthcare and the doctor-patient relationship are only very imperfectly compared with the manufacture and retail of a consumer good. And that the medical ecology is rather different to that of the supermarket. I've argued that for all its strengths and difficulties, the drive-through conception of medic medicine impoverishes the practice by neglecting core understandings of healthcare as a vocation to serve the needy, a profession with internal goals and a received ethic, and a social good that grounds rights and responsibilities in a community. <coughs> there are important truths in these three traditional understandings of healthcare worthy of recovering today in the face of the continued commodification. Kathleen Kaveny makes the point that as a corporal work of mercy, healthcare finds its purpose in offering comfort, care and a pledge against the final loneliness to those whom medicine can no longer cure. In the end, that will be each and every one of us. For much of human history, this aspect of healthcare was its dominant one, she says. In the contemporary era, we see it in the hospice movement. It at its core, it remains the call to solidarity as witnessed in the work of Mother Teresa. Drive through medicine has its advantages, but it cannot inspire such compassion or motivate such corporal works of mercy. If we want a world in which the Mother Teresas, and not just the missionaries of charity, but also the sisters of charity, and their many friends will do their stuff, we need space for an alternative conception of the patient, the carer, the relationship, and the surrounding institutions. Thank you.